his Okay, uh, welcome to episode 20. Uh, this episode is on applications of exponential and logarithmic equations. And uh, this is, by the way, Math 1050, <coughs> excuse me, College Algebra. I'm Dennis Allison, and I teach in the Mathematics Department at Utah Valley State College. Uh, let's go to the list of, of objectives for this, for this episode. Uh, first of all, we'd like to continue the discussion on logarithmic scales that we introduced at the end of episode 19. So we have, to, we'd like to talk about the Richter scale and decibel level of sound. Then we'll move to uh, exponential growth, radioactive decay, and Newton's law of cooling. Those are all uh, exponential, those are all equations that involve exponents, exponents and logarithms. Um, okay, first of all, logarithmic scales. At the end of episode 19, we talked about the pH of a solution, and we were saying how numbers that are generally either very, very close together or numbers that are very, very sp spread out on the number line can be shown closer together if you take their logarithms. Now, let me give you an example. Uh, take, for example, uh, the Richter scale. Now, what would you be measuring if you measured it with a Richter scale? Earthquakes. Earthquakes, exactly. Now, uh, uh, earthquakes can vary in intensity, and sometimes they can be millions, even billions of times more intense than other earthquakes, which are b relatively minor tremors. So the question is, how do you describe the intensity of an earthquake when it can be billions of times more intense than some other earthquake? Uh, so here's, what, here's what's generally done. If we go to the green board, uh, suppose we say S is the minimum intensity of an earthquake that could be measured uh, uh, using technology. So this is the minimum intensity. And suppose there is an earthquake that occurs and its intensity is measured to be I. So this is, let's say, the actual intensity of an earthquake uh, that is measured on some occasion. So what we do is take the ratio I over S now, what we were just saying is sometimes uh, the intensity of an earthquake can be millions or perhaps billions of times stronger than the minimum earthquake. So this ratio could be a million or even a, a billion. So what is generally done is you take the logarithm of that, which makes the number considerably smaller, and I'm going to call that M for the magnitude of the earthquake, and this is the Richter scale measurement that you would, um, that you would normally hear in the press. Uh, so, for example, what if we had an earthquake that was one uh, million times greater than S? So I would be one million times S. If I substitute into that formula, look what the magnitude turns out to be. Uh, the logarithm would be uh, the log of the ratio of one million S over S. Now, just to make sure I've explained that clearly, S represents the minimum intensity that could be detected uh, by, um, by the, by the, the uh, equipment. And uh, the earthquake is actually a million times greater than that. Well, this reduces to be the log of one million. And so a logarithm is an exponent. And so the question is, uh, the value of this logarithm uh, would be the exponent based uh, that you'd put on 10, base 10, to get a million, and I think that turns out to be six. So if the, if the Richter scale measurement is a six, if you have, let's say, a 6.0 earthquake, then that means the earthquake was a million times greater than the minimum intensity that can be measured by the equipment. And in fact, earthquakes can be greater than that. Um, typical earthquakes that I've heard of recently have been in the scale of 3.4 to maybe 4.4, something like that. So they were less than a million times greater. But that does sound very intense, doesn't it? Uh, if the intensity were 3, if the, if the Richter scale measurement were 3, it'd be a thousand times greater than the minimum. And if the intensity or the Richter scale number were 4, it would be 10,000 times greater. And earthquakes have actually been detected up to about 8.9 for the Richter scale measurement. So that's up close to uh, one, one billion times greater. Okay, let me ask you a question about this then. Uh, suppose, 
we have, let's see, I better write my formula down up here at the top. M is equal to the log of I over S. So suppose we measure an earthquake uh, and its intensity turns out to be 855,000 times S, times that minimum intensity. So what would the Richter scale number for this be? Well, if I substitute that in for I, just like I did in the previous problem, um, I would get the logarithm of 855,000 times S all over S. Uh, but the only difficulty this time is we're going to have to use a calculator to determine this number because I don't think we're going to end up with something quite as easily evaluated as the log of 1 million was a moment ago. So this will be the log of 855,000 because the S's have canceled out back here. And I see everybody's uh, got the calculators out there. Stephen, what did you get for that value? Um, 5.93. A 5.93 is the, is the magnitude. You notice this number is almost 6. And you see if it were 6, it would have been 1 million exactly. This is a little bit under that. So we're going to get a number a little under 6. Uh, but if the magnitude had been 5, that would have been the magnitude when the intensity was 100,000 since 10 to the fifth power is 100,000. So this would be somewhere between 5 and 6, closer to 6, because this number is closer to a million. Um, okay, so that would be the, the Richter scale value. So the next time you hear of an earthquake and they give you uh, the intensity as the Richter scale magnitude, uh, this is how you, de how you determine how it compares with the minimum intensity that you could have detected at all. Now, there's a similar situation for measuring the decibel level of sound. And the formula for decibel level, if we go to the next graphic, I think we can see it on here. <coughs> this is a summary of actually the three logarithmic scales that we've talked about in the previous episode and today. In fact, let's just go up to the top. There's our pH formula for a solution. The pH is equal to the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. And we said that if the pH were less than 7, it would be acetic. And if the pH were greater than 7, it's said to be basic. Uh, then there's the Richter scale magnitude, m. m is the log of I over S. We just talked about that one. And now we come to the decibel level of sound. And the decibel level, we'll call it, uh, actually it should be dB, not just B. But the level, decibel level dB of sound is, um, and that should be 10 times the log of I over I naught. So there are a couple typos there, but let me, let me just correct that formula here on the green screen. So the decibel level uh, dB is equal to 10 times the log of I over I naught. So there was, a, there was a D omitted, I think, on that graphic. And there was a 10 omitted in the formula. But if you look on the website, I think you'll see this, this uh, typed in in this, in this form. Uh, well, once again, if you're measuring sound, I sub 0 represents the minimum intensity of sound that can be detected. In fact, that would be so soft that uh, you probably wouldn't be able to hear it. But it, it could be measured. Uh, by an instrument. So I sub zero represents the minimum intensity of a sound that, that, could be, that could be detected. Now, you know, this value was actually determined some time ago, and modern electronic equipment can detect sounds even more faint than this, but they still use this, this basic number here. <coughs> and I represents uh, the, the actual intensity of the sound that you're measuring. So for example, what if you hear a car backfire, or you hear somebody beat on a drum, or you hear somebody whisper in your ear? That would be the intensity of the sound that you hear. And that is measured uh, numerically using um, electronic, uh, um, uh, in, in, uh, using electronic instruments. OK, so then what you do is you take the ratio of I over I naught. So I would be some multiple of I naught. You cancel off the I naughts and take the logarithm. And then you multiply by 10. The reason you multiply by 10 now is because these numbers tend to be rather close together. So 10 helps to sort of uh, magnify the numbers and stretch them out a little bit. Um, OK, so suppose we have a sound whose intensity turns out to be 100 times the minimum intensity that could be detected. OK, now that, that, would, that would still actually be a very soft sound. And so the decibel level of this sound would be 10 times 
the log of, let's see, I over I naught, that'll be 100 I naught over I naught, or I sub zero. And so this would be 10 times the log of 100, because the I naughts cancel off. Uh, now, what is the log of 100? Two. It's 2, right. This is base 10, and 10 to the second power is 100, and the logarithm is an exponent. So this is actually 10 times 2, so the decibel level turns out to be 20. If I hadn't multiplied by 10, then obviously the answer would have just been 2. And if you don't multiply by 10, these numbers tend to be rather close together. So the, the purpose of the 10 in front is merely to kind of magnify them a bit and spread them out so they're a little bit further apart. So this turns out to be 20, uh, 20 decibel units uh, for its intensity. Okay, so those are, those are the other two uh, logarithmic scales I wanted to discuss that we had to move over from the previous episode, the Richter scale and the decibel level of sound. Um, let's now move to a totally different uh, topic here and look at applications of exponential equations and logarithms to uh, real life problems that we haven't really gotten to consider in much detail up until now. Uh, let's go to the first graphic. <coughs> Uh, this is the law of exponential growth, and it says the population n of t at time t uh, is given by the formula n of t equals n sub zero e to the rt power, where n sub zero is the initial population and r is the rate of growth. Now, uh, this formula should sort of sound a bit familiar. We talked about something like this earlier when we were discussing compound interest. And who remembers what type of compounding used an exponential equation, something like this? Does anybody recall? Continuous? It was continuous compounding. Very good. Yeah. So rather than having money compounded daily or money compounded in a bank account monthly or even annually, uh, the money was being compounded continuously. That is, theoretically, every moment you wait to withdraw money from your account, uh, you actually have a little bit more money in that account. So it's being compounded continuously. Well, you know, populations grow in the same way. And I think we looked at an example or two of population growth as examples of continuous compounding. And what we mean by that is people are being added to the population. People are leaving the population. People die. People might move away from a city and change the population. And this, these sorts of things can happen during the day, at night, whatever. Uh, people are born, people die, and so forth. So the population tends to be considered to change in a continuous manner. So it's not surprising that we would use an exponential function uh, just as we did for continuous compounding for money to represent continuous compounding for a population. Uh, now, the, the difference is, if you go to the green screen, when I wrote the formula for uh, continuously compounded money, we wrote A equals P E to the RT power P was the initial principal, the amount of money that you put into the account, and A was the amount in the account after, after T uh, periods, or uh, T, T intervals of time, and R was the, was the rate of growth. This time, I'm writing the formula N of T equals N sub zero E to the R T power. You notice how similar they look. Uh, P was the initial principal, N sub zero is the initial population when you begin to take your measurements. R is the rate of growth, T is the number of years, and N of T will be the population after, after T years. For example, look what happens if I substitute in a zero right here, N at zero. I would get N sub zero E to the R times zero power. Well, that's going to be E to the zero power, which is one. So this answer be, ends up being N sub zero. So the population at time zero is n sub zero. Yeah, so that's exactly what we would have expected. Now, given more information, we can make predictions on the population at other times. Let's go to the first example. Um, let's go to the, first, to the next graphic. Uh, in this example, it says the population of a nation is 4,200,000 and grows exponentially at an annual rate of 1.75%. What should the population be in eight years? Now, if, if I'm not mistaken, back in an earlier episode for, um, for this section, we did a problem very much like this. So this is sort of a repeat of an earlier example. What should be the population after eight years? 
but then there's a second question that we've never done before, and that is, how long should it take to reach uh, a population of six million people? Well, let's try solving both of those here on the green screen. See, what do we know? We know that the initial population, n sub zero, was 4.2 million. And so I think when I go to substitute this into my formula, I'll just put in 4.2, because that'll make it look a little shorter, and I'll remember that I'm computing these things in millions. Uh, then we knew that the annual rate of growth was 1.75%. Um, 1.75%. What would that be as a decimal? Zero point what? 1.75%. Point zero one seven five. Point zero one seven five. Thank you very much. Exactly. So in other words, rather than putting in 1.75 for R, that's how that's the percentage. We have to convert it to a decimal to substitute that in. So substituting those into my formula, we have that N of T equals 4.2 million times e to the 0 0.0175 times t power. <clears throat> now you might say, Dennis, that's a very small exponent. Look at that small decimal you have there. This can't grow very rapidly. Well, let's see. The question in part A was to find out what's the population after eight years. So because this is the population and year t equals zero, I'll substitute in an eight and n at 8 is 4.2 e to the 0 0.0175 times 8 power, times 8 power. Now on my calculator, here's what I would do. I, if I were using my TI-82, I would enter 4.2, and then I would press the button um, e to the x power, and then I would enter uh, open parentheses, 0 0.0175 times 8, close parentheses, and then I would push an equal sign. By the way, when you close parentheses, what you'll see on the screen is a total of what's computed in the parentheses. So you have to hit the equal sign to go back and enter the, or to compute the entire amount. Has anybody computed that? Um, I, th I thought maybe some of you had computed that at your seats. I didn't ask you to. Uh, I'll just... Oh, what did you get? 4.83. 4.83, okay, so uh, Susan gets 4.83. That'll be in millions. So if in, um, if in the year t equals zero, the population is 4.2 million, let's say that if the population right now is 4.2 million, then in eight years, let's see, eight years from now, it would be 4.83 million. So it's increased by uh, about 600,000, a little over 600,000. That's because the, the rate of increase here is, uh, is relatively, relatively low. Okay, um, now the second question, I'm going to leave that formula up there and go to question B, was when will the population be 6 million? Well, we've never been able to solve a problem like this before. I think part A, we had actually worked a problem like that back in episode um, 18 or 19, something like that. So, um, but now what do we do if we want to find out when is the population going to be 6 million? Well, that means I want this to be 6 million right here, the n of t. Can we go to the green screen? Okay, so uh, the question is, when will the population be 6 million? So I'm going to put a 6 for the n of t. Not, not 6 million, because we didn't make it 4.2 million either. We're just going with the uh, coefficients there. So 6 equals 4.2 times e to the 0 0.0175 t power. Now, uh, you know, in order to solve for t, I need to get the t out of the exponent. That's probably going to mean we'll use logarithms here. But we have this coefficient of 4.2, so I think I'll divide that out first. 6 divided by 4.2 equals e to the 0 0.0175 t power. Um, OK, now to remove an exponent, I'll need to take a log on both sides. Now, I could take log base 10, but what would be a more appropriate logarithm base to use in this situation? A natural log. Natural logarithm, because we have a base e here. Um, you know, someone may say, Dennis, should you cancel off a 6, because 6 will divide into 4.2, and 6 will divide into the 6, obviously. Uh, not really necessary. You can reduce it if you want, but um, I don't think that's really going to save us much time, so I think I'll just leave it in that form. And I'll take the natural log of 6 over 4.2, and that's equal to the natural log 
of e to the 0.0175t power. Um, now, this first expression I could write as the natural log of 6 minus the natural log of 4.2. That's using the sec second property of the four basic laws of logarithms. And on the other side, if I bring the exponent out in front, I have 0.0175t uh, out in front of the natural log of e. <coughs> what is the natural log of e, by the way? One. Is one, yeah. So this is just a one right here. So <coughs> what we're down to is the difference of these logarithms is equal to this decimal times t. So t is equal to the natural log of 6 minus the natural log of 4.2 all over 0 0.0175. And that is approximately, let's see, has anybody computed that? Okay, let me just compute it right here. What I get is, I'll work it over here on the side of the screen, the natural log of 6 <coughs> minus the natural log of 4.2. I'll enter that and then I'll divide it by 0. Point, whoops, 0. 0.0175. And I get uh, about 20.4, rounding up, 20.4. Now that would be in years. <coughs> and so it's going to take the population a little over 20 years to get up to 6 million people. You remember just a moment ago in Part A, it took 8 years to go from 4.2 to 4.83. Whoops, 4.83. And it takes about 20 years to go from 4.2 up to six million people. So that, that sounds about right under these conditions that it would take about 20 years. Okay, um, <clears throat> that's a population problem. Let's see how much time we have. I think I'll do one more example of a population problem. Uh, this time, rather than the population of a city, let's say we make this a biology problem. And what if I have a sealed culture? So it, let me just draw something like this on the screen. Suppose we have like a Petri dish and there's a certain amount of bacteria that's growing inside the Petri dish. And let's say we, since we can't really count the bacteria one by one, I mean, they're just too small, what we do is we look at, uh, at the population in terms of area, how much area is covered by the, by the bacterium. So let's say that uh, initially at uh, time t equals zero, let's say the population was esti est estimated to be 3,000 units of bacteria. Now, they may not, may not actually be 3,000 bacteria, but maybe 3,000 square units of bacteria in a small grid. And uh, if that's the initial population, let's say that after, um, after uh, two days, I'll call this T sub 2, what if the population has grown to um, 10,000? Now, I mean, I'm not a biologist, so this may be too short of a time, or too much of a time for a population to go from 3,000 to 10,000. But the question might be, what would be the population of bacteria after, let's see, now that was two days going from 3,000 to 10,000. So let's say, what would be the population after, um, after five days? What's the population after, after five days? Well, let's see, we're assuming the law of natural exponential growth. So that means I'm assuming that the number of bacteria is equal to n sub zero times e to the r t power. <coughs> and we know what t sub zero is, it's 3,000. So n of t is equal to 3,000 times e to the r times t power. Okay, now, we know that after two days, the population becomes 10,000. So if I put in a 10,000 on the left, what will I need to substitute in on the right? If the population's 10,000 after two days, how would I change what I've written on the right-hand side? I think I'll just put in a 2 for the t, because this is after two days. So this would be 3,000 times e to the r times 2 power. So... Um, Let's see, in this equation, it looks like we could solve for r. And to solve for r, I'm going to divide by 3,000. So 10,000 over 3,000 is equal to e to the 2r power. I can cancel off the thousands and just say this is 10 thirds equals e to the 2r power. And if I take a natural log on both sides, that says the natural log of 10 thirds is equal to the natural log 
of e to the 2r. Can anyone tell me right offhand what is the natural log of e to the 2r power? It's 2r. It's 2r, exactly. That would be 2r. And therefore, r is equal to, can I squeeze, I think I can squeeze this in on the screen, r will, is equal to 1 half of the natural log of 10 thirds. Now, the reason I'm writing it that way is because I want to go back and substitute in for r up here in my original formula. And this says n of t equals, let's say n naught was zero, was oh, 3,000 rather. So 3,000 times e to the 1 half ln of 10 thirds times t. Well, if I take r times, here's r, times t, that's going to be t over 2 ln 10 thirds. Now, the reason I haven't evaluated the natural log, like I haven't ev evaluated the natural log down here, is because I can actually reduce this expression. Uh, look what happens now. I'll try to write this a little larger so you can see it better. N of t is 3,000 times e to the natural log of 10 thirds, and then outside, I'm going to put t over 2. Is, is it clear what I'm doing there? I'm taking a product in the exponent, and I'm putting one factor inside on the e, and I'm putting one factor outside on the t over 2, uh, as t over 2. And so e raised to this power, natural log power, to the t over 2 power is e to the product. Now, I can reduce that to be 3,000 times, um, what is e to the natural log of 10 thirds? That's actually property four from our four laws of logarithms. If you take base e and raise it to a log base e of 10 thirds, you get 10 thirds to the t over two power. So here's my formula for the population of bacteria at time t. It's the initial population times 10 thirds, it's no longer base e, but 10 thirds to the t over two power and I was able to bring in my natural logarithm on the base e to make that base change. Now the question we asked was, what was the population after five days? So I'll substitute in a five here, and I get 3,000 times 10 thirds to the five halves power. And let me just compute that and see what we get here. Um, Let's see, if I put my calculator in the middle, will we be able to zoom in on that? Let's just try zooming in while I, yeah, here we go. Okay, so I'm going to try computing 3,000 times the quantity 10 divided by 3, close parentheses, because see, I want that, in, that entire fraction to be raised to the 5 halves power, raised to the uh, 5 halves, I'll call it 2.5, to the 2.5 power, enter. And what we get here is 60,000 858. So we'll say it's a roughly um, 61,000 approximately. 61,000. The reason I'm rounding off into such a small accuracy is because we, don't, we can't really count the bacteria individually. So I'm just going to say that the population's grown from 3,000 to roughly 61,000 uh, as, a, as a rough estimate for that. Let's see if that makes sense. Uh, you notice in the first uh, two days, the population more than tripled. So in the next two days, you'd assume that it would more than triple again. So when you get to, uh, this was t equals zero, that was the initial time, this was after two days. So after four days, it should more than triple, it should be well over 30,000. And then in one more day, it should be up to maybe 61,000. So that sounds about right. <coughs> okay, let's go to a different application. And this one has to do with radioactive decay. Uh, let's go to the next graphic. <coughs> OK, this is uh, known as the law of exponential decay. It's almost ident identical to the law of exponential growth. Um, it says the mass of a radioactive substance is given by the formula m of t, m for mass, m of t equals m naught e to the negative rt power. The difference is we have a negative in the exponent. And I've changed the name of the function from n to m, so that's, that's a small change. Uh, and the reason, um, the reason there's a negative in the exponent is because if we go to the green screen here, you see when you have a radioactive substance, let's say that at time zero, there's, you have this much of a radioactive substance. But over time, the radioactivity uh, 
drops off. And the radioactivity gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and it approaches, but theoretically it never reaches zero. And let's say that the amount of radioactive material here was, um, I'll call it M sub zero for the, the amount of mass at time zero. And at some point, it will decay to exactly half of that right about here. This would be one half M sub zero. This is the time axis. And uh, at, at some time, the amount of radioactive material will be only half of what it was initially. So this distance right here is referred to as the half-life. Now you might say, Dennis, what happens to the radioactive material? Why does it, be, why, why does it decay? Well, you see, in a radioactive substance like uh, uranium or plutonium or many other radioactive materials, <coughs> what happens is these, uh, these, uh, these atoms that are radioactive, uh, when they decay, what they give off are these subatomic particles like alpha and beta particles and so forth. I'm not really a nuclear physicist to explain this probably very well. Uh, but what is left behind is a stable element. And uh, so the radioactive material doesn't just disappear, it just becomes stable. But there's still some other radioactive atoms that are, uh, that are still decaying. And so over time, there become fewer and fewer and fewer of them. And the amount of time it takes for half of the material to become stable is called a half-life. <clears throat> okay, so with that idea, um, let's go back to the green signal. Let me, let me just point out one more thing. With, with that idea, you see what happens is this curve is an exponential function, but it's decreasing rather than increasing. So this function is expressed as m of t equals m sub zero, that's a zero, e to the negative rt, and there's a negative because the function is decreasing. For population growth, the function is increasing and going up, but we have a function that's decreasing and approaching zero. Okay, if we go back to that graphic, we have a problem on that graphic that we'd like to solve. <clears throat> and the problem goes like this. It says a 300 milligram sample of, po of po polonium-224 has a half-life of 140 days. So the question is, how much remains after one year? Well, let me just ask the class a question about this. We have 300 milligrams to begin with, and the half-life is 140 days. So after 140 days, how much radioactive uh, po polonium-240 should there be? after 140 days. 150 milligrams? 150 milligrams, right, because half of it would have decayed and half of it is still radioactive. Now, in another 140 days, half of that will decay and you'll drop from 150 to 75. And in another 140 days, half of the 75 will become stable and you'll be down to half of 75, which is 37.5. So you see how this keeps reducing by half every 140 days. Well, the question is, how much remains after one year? Okay, now, a, a student might say, well, Dennis, couldn't you just keep uh, reducing it every 140 days until you get to a year? But the problem is, you may not hit exactly on a year. You may go from just before one year to just after one year, so it's difficult to say how much there will be in the middle of an interval like that. So if we go to the green screen, I think we can solve this algebraically. Our formula says M of T equals m sub zero e to the negative rt. So when we talk about the law of radioactive decay, you have to remember to put a negative up there, and if you're talking about population growth, you put a positive in the exponent. Okay, now our initial amount was 300 milligrams. So I'll put a 300 right there, e to the negative rt. And we know that the half-life is 140 days. Let me just make a note of that over here, half-life 140 days. I didn't write half-life very well. I hope you can read that. The half-life. Well, that's going to give me yet another value I can plug in here. Because what that means is uh, when t is equal to 140 days, then the mass is going to be 150 milligrams. And this was in days right here. So if I substitute 150 for the mass, I'll have to put in 140 for t, 300 e to the negative r times 140. I'll put parentheses around the negative r there. Well, you notice there's only one variable left here, and that's r. So by knowing the half-life 
And by knowing the initial mass, I'm able to calculate R. So that's what I want to do next, is to solve for R. Um, and to solve for R, the first thing I'll do is divide by 300, and that gives me a 1 half, equals e to the negative 140 R. I went ahead and multiplied out the exponent. But when the variable's in the exponent, how do I solve for it? Well, I've got to get it on the ground, and that means use logarithms. So I think I'll take a natural log on both sides. The natural log of a half equals the natural log of e to the negative 140R. Uh, by the way, I can bring the negative 140R out in front times ln of e. And as we said before, the natural log of e is 1, so this is negative 140R. So ln of 1 half equals negative 140R. Solving for R, I get negative 1 over 140 times ln of 1 half. Okay, you might say, well, that's great, Dennis. How are you going to figure out how much, how much of this radioactive material is left after a year? Well, what I have to do is get my formula precise. So I'm going to take this R and substitute it right back up there. And this tells me that M of T is equal to 300 times E to the negative R power. Let's see, a negative R, R is already negative. Two negatives are going to cancel. And that's going to be 1 over 140 times the natural log of 1 half times t. Now that looks really messy, doesn't it? But uh, because I have a logarithm in the exponent, I can reduce this. I'm going to write this as 300 times e to the ln of 1 half. You notice I'm putting the log and the base e together. And what's left outside? is going to be the 1 over 140 and the t. So I'll just call it t over 140. What is e to the natural log of 1 half power going to be? 1 half. It's 1 half. Very good. So this tells me that m of t is equal to 300 times 1 half to the t over 140. This is my formula for the mass after time t. Now you see it started off looking like this expression up here and it ends up looking like a different exponential expression with a base one half. You say how did base e become one half? Well what, what, what we did was we had a natural log in the exponent and I was able to change the base because of that. Susan changed that for us. Okay so the question was what is going to be the mass that's radioactive, a radioactive material after one year? Uh, well, let me just erase some of the things in the middle, and I'll use the formula here at the bottom to calculate that. Are there any questions about this before I erase any of that? Anyone here in the classroom? Okay, if not, let me just take out this middle portion here. And um, I think I'll move my formula up here to the top to kind of get it out of the way. So M of T is 300 times 1 half to the t over 140 power. That's, that's the formula that we've created. And we want to find out how much is left after one year. Can anyone tell me what I would do with this to figure that out? <coughs> how much is left after one year? What would t be? One year? Well, or, except or we were working this in days. days. So, so we can't plug in one, it'll think that means one day. 360. 365. 365. 365. So I'm going to calculate M at 365. Yeah, I think, I think David had a good point. Seems like you'd plug in one for one year, but our units on time are days. So this would be 300 times one half to the 365 over 140 power. And that is... Uh, let's see, you know, I could reduce that exponent a little bit. Well, on a calculator, I don't see that it has that much effect. But if I divide by 5, it looks like we're going to get uh, 73 over um, 28. 73 over 28. I don't know that it was worth the time to take to divide that out, because on a calculator, this is going to be computed rather quickly anyway. Uh, if you can zoom in on my calculator, I'll lay it right over the top of this. And we had 300 uh, times the quantity 1 half, so I'll say 0.5, 
raised to the power of, and the quantity is 73 divided by 28, close parentheses. And I get a zero, let's see, maybe I left out a multiplication sign. Let me try that again. 300 times the quantity 0.5, close parentheses, raised to the power of 73 divided by 20. Oh, gotta, gotta, let me go back here and enter parentheses. Open parentheses, 73 divided by 28, close parentheses, equals, ah, there we go, 49 point, oh, let's say about 49.2. So I think the problem was I didn't put in a multiplication sign after the 300. So this will be about uh, 49.2 milligrams. Uh, let's just compare that with what we could calculate quickly. You know, originally, when time t equals zero, we had three, when time t equals zero, we had 300 milligrams. And then when time, when t was 140, we were down to 150 milligrams because half of it decayed. And after another 140, that puts us up at 280, this will be 75 milligrams because half of the 150 decays. And after another 140, that's going to put us more than a year, 420, it's going to be 37.5 milligrams. So we figure the answer should be between 75 and 37 and a half, and we got 49.2. So I think that seems perfectly reasonable for this problem. Okay. Um, let's see, let's go to the next graphic and look at Newton's Law of Cooling. Um, okay, here is the third application of exponential equations and logarithms. Uh, and Newton's Law of Cooling refers to Isaac Newton, and here's, here's generally what Isaac Newton says. He says, if an object, let's see, if, if T sub zero is the initial temperature of an object, Let's say you're taking a baked potato out of the oven. So T sub zero is the temperature of the baked potato. And T sub R is the constant room temperature. So let's say the oven is in a room that's uh, 75 degrees. Uh, so when you take the baked potato out, the potato begins to cool, but the room stays at a constant temperature. So the room temperature is T sub R. Then the difference between the temperature, t capital T at little t, of the object and the room temperature, T sub R, the difference between the object temperature and the room temperature is equal to the initial difference of temperatures, which is T sub zero minus T sub R, times E to the negative RT power. Now, this is another instance uh, very similar to radioactive decay. I have a negative in the exponent because the, uh, the object is approaching room temperature, so the difference is approaching zero. Let me see if I can explain this with a graph, and we'll come back to that graphic in just a moment. Okay, here's the time axis, here's the temperature axis, and let's say here's the room temperature, T sub R. That's what I call T sub R. So I'm going to draw a little dotted line across there. And when I take the object out of the oven, let's say its temperature is way up here because it's very hot, we'll call it T sub zero. This is the initial difference, T sub zero minus T R. So that difference is T0 minus TR. However, the object begins to cool, and we're assuming the room temperature never changes. And therefore, the difference begins to decay, the difference in temperatures. And so at any given time, T, capital T of little t, is the temperature of the object. And this is always up here at TR. So the difference in those temperatures begins to decay and that, that difference approaches zero. So the way this is expressed is to say capital T at little t minus T sub r, that would be the difference between the cooling object and the room temperature, is equal to the initial difference, okay, this is the initial difference over here, times e to the negative r t power. Uh, so, this time I have differences that are decaying, not the actual temperature, but the differences are decaying, or, are decaying and uh, this formula will tell me what is the difference in temperatures at any given time. Now, if I solve for the temperature at time t, I just need to add t sub r on the other side, and so this formula looks like this, where I put t sub r added on the other side. 
And if we go back to the graphic, you'll see the second formula is also expressed on that graphic. Can we go back? There we are. So the first formula I wrote says that the, that the instantaneous difference between the temperatures is equal to the initial difference times e to the negative rt power. R expressed in another form, capital T at T, equals T0 minus TR, e to the negative rt, plus the room temperature. Now this is a bit of an idealized problem because if you take a hot object like a baked potato and set it in the room, it actually does change the room temperature ever so slightly. So the room temperature doesn't stay constant. But if we assume this is a big room, so there's a lot of air that would have to be warmed up, and let's say the air conditioning is running and so the heat is being blown away and the room temperature stays constant, then under those conditions, Newton's law of cooling applies. Okay, so we have an example of this. <coughs> The example says, a cup of coffee with temperature 200 degrees Fahrenheit is placed in a 70 degree room. After 10 minutes, the coffee temperature is 150 degrees. Find the temperature five minutes later. Okay, well, let's take our formula. So first, let me express my formula up here. The room, or the, the object temperature is the initial difference in temperatures times e to the negative rt plus tr. That was because I moved it over from the other side. And the only reason I'm writing it this way is because it allows me to isolate the temperature of the object. Now, the initial object temperature was 200 degrees. And the room temperature, which we're assuming remains constant, is 70 degrees. And we know that the temperature of the object after 10 minutes was 150 degrees. Okay, what this is going to allow me to do is to calculate R. And once I calculate R, and I know all the other numbers in here, then I can calculate the temperature at any given time. Okay, well let's just assemble this information into our formula. Uh, the temperature of the object at time t is the initial difference. Well, let's see, what's the initial difference in temperatures? 130. 130, so I'll put 130 there e to the negative rt plus, then the room temperature is 70. Okay, now, uh, that's my basic formula, but I don't know the value of r. So now I'm going to substitute in the 10, and after 10 minutes, the temperature is 150 degrees, and I'll put in a 10 for t, so I get 130 e to the negative r times 10 plus 70. You notice this is an exponential equation and there's only one variable r, so I should be able to solve for it. Uh, let's see, I'll subtract off that 70, and this gives me 80 equals 130 e to the negative 10 r power. Well, as before, I'll divide by 130, and I get 8 over 13 equals e to the negative 10 r power. I'll take a natural logarithm of both sides, and the natural log of 8 over 13 equals negative 10 r. I'm leaving out some steps here. You remember the natural log of e to this power is the exponent. <coughs> and what this tells me is that r is equal to negative 1 tenth ln 8 over 13. Hey, once I know r, I go back up here and I substitute it in. So let's write our formula over here. Uh, t of little t is 130 times e to the, uh, let's see, now that says negative r. Well, the negative of r is a positive one-tenth. Uh, I'll say t over 10, because there's a t out here I have to multiply by, times ln of 8 over 13. Well, just as I've done in previous examples, what I need to do is get the natural logarithm with the base e. So this is 130 e to the natural log of 8 over 13, raised to the power of t over 10. Let me write that a little bit better there. That's over a 13. Okay, here's the most important step. What is e to the natural log of 8 to the, uh, of 8 thirteenths? 8 thirteenths. Okay, that allows me to make this formula look almost pretty. I oh, know, I'm exaggerating. Uh, but it certainly looks a lot better than it did before. Okay, this is our formula for temperature. The question was, what's the temperature five minutes later? Well, five minutes after 10 minutes, that's going to be after 15 minutes. So after 15 minutes, the temperature will be 
What? Uh, oh, you know what? I forgot to add on my 75. There was, oh, no, 70. I forgot to add my room temperature on the end of that. I left off that guy. So after 15 minutes, we get 130 times 8 over 13 to the 15 over 10 power plus 70. Well, of course, that's the 3 halves power. Let's go to the calculator and see how much this is. Uh, I'll put my calculator in the middle of this. And uh, we'll turn it on also. And so I need to take 130 times the quantity, 8 divided by 13. And I need to raise it to the 1.5 power. You know, we had 15 tenths. That's 1.5 power. And then I need to add on 70. And the temperature of the cup of coffee should be 132.7. So, um, yeah, we'll say 132.8. So this is approximately 132.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so theoretically, that's what we would determine the temperature to be. Now, you might say, well, Dennis, is that actually the temperature of the cup of coffee? Well, you know, uh, in the real world, when you put a cup of coffee in a room, the coffee cools down, but also the room heats up ever so slightly. This doesn't take into account the heating of the room as well as the cooling of the coffee. So if the room stays at constant temperature, this should be a fairly accurate answer. Uh, but in real circumstances, this may be off by a degree or two, something like that, so, but this is all idealized. We have one more example I'd like to look at before we run out of time. This one's sort of exciting. Murder, they said. Okay, here's the situation. You've, uh, you found a body. We assume the original temperature was 98.6. But when you find the body, when the police find the body, the temperature is 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And you've arrived at 9 o'clock. That's when you took this 90 degree temperature. So what you do is take another reading a little later. The temperature 15 minutes later is 88.8 .8 degrees Fahrenheit. And the room has stayed 70 degrees Fahrenheit. When did the murder take place? Okay, so uh, in this case, I'm going to let T sub zero not be the initial temperature of the body, but the temperature when, when the temperature was first taken, that was 90 degrees. So this would be at 9 o'clock. And at 9 o'clock, the temperature of the body was 90. The room temperature was 70. And I'll have to put a 70 over here. Now, we know that 15 minutes later, let's see, 15 minutes later, uh, whoops, well, we know that the temperature 15 minutes later was 88.8, .8, so I'll put an 88.8 .8 here, and I'll put in 15 minutes for T. That'll be 20 E to the negative 15 T plus 70. So 15, whoops, times R. So 15 minutes later, the temperature is 88.8. .8. Now, what this does is allows me to solve for R. I'll subtract off a of 70 and get 18.8 .8 equals 20 e to the negative 15r. And then as you've seen me do before, I'll divide by the 20, and that'll be uh, 0 0.94 equals e to the negative 15r. Taking a natural logarithm on both sides, the natural log of 0 0.94 is negative 15t. I've left out the step where I bring the exponent out in front. It's just negative 15t. Uh, 15r, I'm sorry, there should be r's there on both of those. So solving for R, that's going to be negative 1 15th ln 0 0.94. Okay, now with that, I go back to my original formula up here, and I substitute for R, and now I have a, now I have a, a clear definition of the temperature of the body. So this says the temperature at time t is 20 times e to the t over 15 ln 0 0.94 plus 70. I've done a little manipulation here. I put the t, multiplied the t into the numerator. So this becomes the temperature at time t is 20 times e to the ln of 0 0.94 power raised to the t over 15 plus 70. Now, what does this reduce to be here? e to the natural log of uh, 0.94. 0.94. 0.94, exactly. So this is 20 times 0 0.94 to the t over 15 power plus 70. 
Okay, this is our definition for the temperature of the body at time t. We want to know when is the temperature 98.6. So I'll put 98.6 here and I'll solve for t. t is going to be a negative value because we're talking about times prior to time t equals zero. That was nine o'clock. So I'm going to solve this for t, 0 0.94 to the t over 15 power plus 70. Well, to solve for t, I have to use logarithms again. I'll subtract off the 70 and I get 28.6. And the next step is divide by the 20. So I get 1.43 equals 0 0.94 to the t over 15 power. <clears throat> I'm going to take a logarithm on both sides. So I have ln of 1.43 equals t over 15 times ln of 0 0.94. I need a little room, so let me move over to this other side here. And uh, we'll just uh, chop that portion off there. So t is going to be 15 ln 1.43 divided by ln 0 0.94. Now, how much is that approximately? Well, let's do this on the calculator. Uh, so if you can zoom in on this, uh, we're going to get 15 times the natural log of 1.43 uh, divided by the natural log of 0.94 and that's negative 86, we'll say negative 87. How about negative 90? That's, that's an hour and a half, negative 90. So what we get here is approximately negative 90 minutes. So that says the murder was committed about an hour and a half before nine o'clock, so we figure the murder was at 7.30 p.m., more or less. Of course, there's room for error, but that, that tells, gives us a rough estimate. Next time you're watching Law and Order, you'll, you'll know how they figure these things out. Hey, I'll see you next time. We're going to be reviewing for uh, exam number three. That's in episode 21. Um, and uh, you'll be able to use a calculator on some portions of this next exam for problems like this. We'll talk about this in the next episode. And I will see you then.